Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 401. When people are zigging, you should be zagging. When everyone is telling you to go one way, that is a sure sign you need to find another. Anonymous. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, welcome to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humbled and quarantined host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a profitable business. It's harder today than ever before for independent filmmakers to make money with their films. From predatory film distributors ripping them off to huckster film aggregators who prey upon them, the odds are stacked against the indie filmmaker. The old distribution model of making money with your film is broken and there needs to be a change. The future of independent filmmaking is the entrepreneurial filmmaker or the film entrepreneur. In Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, I break down how to actually make money with your film projects and show you how to turn your indie film into a profitable business. With case studies examining successes and failures, this book shows you the step-by-step method to turn your passion into a profitable career. If you're making a feature film, series, or any other kind of video content, the Film Entrepreneur method will set you up for success. The book is available in paperback, ebook, and of course, audiobook. If you want to order it, just head over to www.filmbizbook.com. That's film, B-I-Z, book.com. Before we get started, guys, I set up a special link to help people affected by the coronavirus, and you can donate to Feed America. There is a lot of people in need out there, and Feed America is a great organization and they're helping millions of people on a daily basis, and they also need your help. If you want to donate even five bucks, 10 bucks, it goes a long way. Head over to IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash help. Well, guys, today on the show, we have a director that shot a time-traveling feature film in two days. And how he did it is an amazing story, which has to do with a house renovation of all things. His name is Grant Piccola. And Grant, like I said, shot his feature film in two days with it with a seven-month window in between, which is the before and after of his house renovation. Way to use some amazing production value that is essentially free because you're already doing a house renovation. Grant's story was pretty remarkable, and it was so remarkable, in fact, that he made a documentary about how he did this. And and by the way, guys, it's not just like a master shot theater, like it's just people talking one day and talking on another day. This is a very dynamic film. He's running around, getting all sorts of different shots, different angles, has a great energy to it. It has a very back to the future, Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg vibe to the film. And in this documentary called uh, Making Up Time, he... He really explains a lot about how he did it. And of course, it's on Indie Film Hustle TV. So I'll have a link for that in the show notes as well. But in this conversation, we go deep into how he did it, why he did it, and all just the insane ups and downs and tips and tricks that you can take from this episode and hopefully inspire you to go out and make something. And in the world that we live in today, which is the COVID landscape, you know, making a film in a house in a very controlled environment over two days is obviously one of the more perfect shooting situations for a feature film uh, moving forward for at least the next six to 18 months. And if you want to shoot something, this might be a great inspiration to you. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Grant Piccola. I'd like to welcome to the show Grant Piccola, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show, brother. Hey, Alex. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it, man. You you, you reached out to me. We've been trying to get this done for a while now, so I do appreciate your patience. Uh, But your story is extremely interesting about how you made your movie, and we're going to get to it in a minute. But first, how did you get started in the film business? Well, I think I got started probably the way most boring stories start. So I was a kid, junior high, high school, making films with my friends, shooting stuff for sports teams, editing them. 
And uh, it wasn't until I got to college where I thought, like, maybe this is something I should really focus on and go kind of all in on, so to speak. And so when I graduated from Central Michigan University, I started a grad school program. And I knew after two years, either A, you end up writing like an 80-page thesis, or B, you go for some sort of production. And against some of the teachers, like... uh, wise words, we said, we're not only going to do a production, but we're going to do a feature. And it eventually had 100 people involved. It was in 20 <laughs> locations. It was a massive script. Uh, so back when Amazon Studios was still a thing, um, I had tracked down like all these scripts that could be potential, uh, that we could shoot low budget, reached out to our writer, got the rights to just shoot it for a student project, and um, turned out being awesome. But 33 34 shoot day schedule and we came in <laughs> at 33 so it was a very like like uh how do i say this? streamlined Long, it was streamlined but it was a lengthy kind of typical production mm-hmm. uh yeah so like 30 some days basically and what was the budget of that film uh that i believe was six thousand dollars 33 days for six grand did nobody get paid <laughs> no we are all students. We are all volunteers. It was just an, it was an, it was basically a learning experience. Yes. Yep. Got, and did you, you directed that film? Yeah. Um, it was, it was definitely the biggest undertaking I've ever had like today. It was just, it was very large, but never, no egos on sets. Everyone, by the end, we felt like we were so, so much better than our first shoots. And it was just a very positive experience. And it kind of leads into like where I am now because when it comes to shooting a movie in two days, for example, back then in school, you're like, yeah, if we just spread these days out, we've got time. That's the one thing we have in college. And we don't need money, but we can um, figure out windows of opportunities for here, for this and that. But with making time, like I'm currently employed full time. I have a side business. My wife and I shoot uh, weddings. Mm-hmm. And then at the time of doing making time, my wife and I were in the middle of renovating our whole house DIY And we were on like year two out of three years of working on it. And we were about to do this huge kitchen uh, renovation. So basically my time was very limited. So it was like, if I'm going to go for a feature again, there's no way it could have been like 30 days, you know? Mm -hmm. Like I couldn't imagine taking 15 weekends to shoot a film while there's way more important life stage things happening you know mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so to, uh, so you, you you mentioned making time tell us about this mm-hmm. this movie and, and the process of making how you got the idea and so on Whew. so making time is a feature length uh time travel adventure romance that is shot in just two crazy chaotic days with those days being separated by seven months and a house renovation so it was definitely the biggest gamble i've ever taken in my life because i Going into it, like there's no handbook that says, all right, this is what you need to know to shoot your first 61 pages on day one. Um, that just doesn't exist. <laughs> so we went in um, feeling like, A, I hope this works. And B, I also really hope all actors can come back in seven months and like nothing crazy happens. So it was every actor knew going in that this was like, it was kind of gamble, but it was also very... Um, well thought out, so we knew kind of every pitfall that could happen before it came. Um, but I'm, I guess I'm getting off topic. So the story is um, Mason Hydra, who was in Batman versus Superman, uh, cast by Zack Snyder. Pretty freaking awesome that he was willing to um, donate his time to our project. We were doing it just for the love of film, but it was also um, a great opportunity for him to just show off his stuff because, hey, it's a leading role. And how many people in the history of film can say I did 106 pages of dialogue in two days and probably have less than a dozen blooper moments. Like it's insane. It's, it's a um, performance of a lifetime is what I would call it. Mm -hmm. Um, But like getting him on board, um, it's basically, uh, shit. Now I'm going to forget my log line. Now that we're right on the, right on the podcast, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, A workaholic scientist must complete his round trip to the past, but in order to return home, um, 
uh, basically must do all of his footsteps or must, ah, oh, fuck me. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh-huh. I'm totally, uh, ice in here. It's all good. It's all, I, we get the idea. The, the idea of basically, yeah. you know, you have to yeah, go back yeah, in yeah. time to do so. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a time travel movie at this point in the game. Yeah. So it's, a, you're making not only an indie movie, not only in two days, but you're also doing a time travel movie, which time travel mm-hmm. movies in general are not in the indie world other than um, oh, God. Primer. Uh, Primer, exactly. And, mm-hmm. But other than Primer, I really don't remember there being a lot of, of this, this kind of uh, filmmaking in the indie space. So it's a unique film in that sense. That's probably one of the reasons it caught my eye so much was that that vibe. And I've had a chance to kind of uh, over, I saw your trailer and I've, and I've kind of had a chance to kind of look over the film. And I have to say, it does have a, a vibe of, uh, of the most famous, um, the most famous, uh, time travel movie of all time, which is the Back to the Future. It has like that whole very cool energy to it. I'm assuming that's what you mm-hmm. were going after. Yeah. Definitely. That was, it was like not the biggest inspiration in terms of right. where the writing goes, mm-hmm. but the feeling, um, definitely that mixed with anything Pixar mixed with pretty much anything Spielberg. A lot of it was, can we, cre- what I was most interested in is if you did do this and yeah, it's, you know, it's science fiction, so it's fine. But what's more important is if you went back in time and it actually worked, the awe and the inspirational uh, it, it it would just be so um, just kind of unbelievable. And I wanted to capture that and then also capture, you know, the downfalls of the hero's journey and all those things too. So definitely Spielberg hook was an inspiration for Love score. Yeah. Pixar's up um, the family man, uh, even with the feel good ending, we did a little bit of uh, whatever we can move forward, but yeah, definitely that feel good vibe. Yeah, and and that's kind of missing in today's world. Uh, there's not a lot of feel good movies anymore. I mean, they're even <laughs> even Spielberg's not making feel good movies anymore. They're, he's making right. you know heavy dramas at this point in his career. Occasionally, he'll do a Ready Player One, like in you know he hasn't done a fun fun movie in a, in a while. Uh, mm-hmm. And he's kind of set that whole – and then Zumeckis and all those kind of guys, they, they're they not doing those kind of movies. I think we – I miss them. You know, that 80s – that 80s kind of – 80s and early 90s kind of films that just make you feel good when you watch. That's why we go back and watch those movies again. And like Back to the Future, I can turn on right now mm-hmm. and and just watch it. I, you know, I watch all three of them. They're just so much fun and you feel good afterwards and there's adventure and all this kind of stuff. So it's really – Really, a, a great idea for your film, and I think it was very smart of you to align yourself with that vibe, as opposed to yeah. Primer, which is a completely different kind of uh, yeah. time tra- yeah. travel. Movie. Very dry. And what what I was the film I couldn't remember was It's a Wonderful Life. So, yeah. like that was, I told I knew going in I want something that when the movie ends and you get out of your seat to go home, you're smiling. You're not shaking your or itching your head saying like did that how did the time what was the big twist or how did it not like i don't get this or i don't get that i just wanted people i I just wanted to bring bring a little bit of happiness into the world by the time you walk out of the theater so right that was that or 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 turn off your streaming uh yeah (laughs) or as you switch over to netflix or something uh Mm -hmm. (laughs) i know it's the world has changed sir the world has changed now i thought was really cool about your idea is that you had a large piece of production value which was an unfinished home Mm -hmm. and a lot of people would just look at that as an unfinished home and other Mm -hmm. people would go uh, and then you of course said no no there's production value here we could do something because the cost of doing what you would you you eventually did would cost you a lot of money to you know get a house do what you did to it and then build it back up i mean it it, but you just kind of piggybacked on your your life which is a real good indie filmmaking move uh so did that come up did you did the did the the house start the idea basically good question yeah so um I was originally inspired by like Victoria, which was shot in a day, actually just shot in two and a half hours, a single take, you know? And I was thinking like, 
what would it take to pull something off in a day? And I was trying to write a script based on that. And I actually had one finished, but I put it to the side when I started looking at our house and I was just like, you know, this may be either like the coolest idea I ever have or like the dumbest. And <laughs> thankfully with my wife's blessing, like, oh my God, if I didn't have that, um, she was she was okay with us going, all right, we can't slow this house renovation down because we don't have a usable sink right now. We don't have floor. We don't have, like, there's so many things that are I've, moving. I've been there. Life can't I've, stop. I've been there. <laughs> but, I've been there. But what that did mean for me is I got to write a script as fast as I can and go through the revision process as fast as I can, get it really good really fast, and then try to start shooting in this house before it gets too far along and we lose that. And I knew that, all right, so let's say we shoot all of Act 2 like in two months from now and then bring everyone back in like a year or whatever. Well, when you actually watch the film and he goes back in time and now he lands and this house is completely different, that sort of magic is what I wanted to capture. Like that's the promise of the premise and that is it's not us just like taking some picture frames down or hiding something. Right. Like all like 30 boxes of cabinets are just laying on the floor. It's nothing but subfloor. The, the painting's not even done. Everything's just like bare. Um, that was something I really wanted to. And of course, in that moment, we got to start going for wide shots and like really show we're not hiding stuff with zoom lenses. Um, but yeah, that did kick off the movie. And I thought, okay, if a guy is going to go back in the past, who's the best guy to do that? Well, Maybe he's doing all this time travel stuff and he's a workaholic and maybe he's getting divorced in the opening scene. And maybe he goes back to the past and he meets all of a sudden his younger uh, girlfriend who used to be his wife now. And that would be a very interesting dynamic, like seeing your old loved one even though you despise her now. And then what if you learned that night when all of your friends who are showing up who you've neglected – are now patting you on the back because they're excited because you don't even know tonight's the night you invited them all over because you were going to propose to her. So now he's got to propose to this woman who he despises in order to get back home or else the machine won't connect. So it's like (laughs) that creates the juxtaposition, I guess. (laughs) And when does the killer robot come back? (laughs) No killer robot. No No killer killer robots, no Armageddon. What's going on? No. No space time continuum? I mean, are you going to just make the whole world universe explode? <laughs> no, that's the thing. We didn't want this is sci fi, but it's so far from sci fi. We yeah. don't even, I hardly, I put some research into science, but I don't care. I don't, I don't want it's, that. It's I'm, irrelevant. Yes, it's more about an adventure and the romance that brings it all home in the end, you know? I love that scene in uh, Avengers Endgame when they're going back in time and then like the reference point that everyone uses for like the space is back to the future. And they're like, that's not the way it works. That's not science. Exactly. Yeah. Are you really talking about the back to the future as your scientific reference point on time travel? <laughs> I thought it was a great right. scene, but at the end of the day, it doesn't matter. You could, you could throw holes through. Ter- I mean, Terminator has insane amounts of holes and all, all time travel movies doing, it. but, uh, but you, you're, you're, um, you're, you're, you're feeding a master. The, the different kind of master. You're, you're appeasing a different kind of master, which is story and trying to make people feel good. Um, yeah. Now, what I, what I do find um, interesting is a lot of, and I preach this a lot on the show, is to back into what you have access to. You look around at your resources and you write around those resources. And you've taken that to a whole other level <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> by, by creating this entire kind of story and subplot uh, around uh, – around the time travel and around the, I mean, it's just, I just, I never thought of it. And I thought it was just like, man, why didn't I think of that? I've been in a house that didn't have, that I was renovating. I could mm-hmm. like, it, it was a very smart way of adding an immense amount of production value. Uh, at essentially no cost. And by the way, what, if you don't mind me asking, can you tell us the budget or you're close to, you know, just generally what the budget was on this? The budget for this was $4,000. That's fantastic. That's yeah. fantastic. We- yeah, we came together basically for the love of film. And when I pitched it to everyone, I said, your total commitment on this, other than you know memorizing lines, and some actors only had small scenes or whatever, is basically a day or two days, depending on if you're in day one or day two. So you show up, bust it out, and like Mason said, yeah, Mason said, after, after day one, 
he, he came into day two and he's like, man, I, I, I keep forgetting this film exists. Like it was so big and then it all just halted and then disappeared out of my life for like five months. And I started memorizing again, but, um, it's, it's just so different. So, uh, right, so go ahead, go ahead. Oh, uh, uh, to add to what you're saying about using what you have available, mm-hmm. um, the guys at Draft Zero podcast, they once did an episode on movies that are all in one location. And I knew, okay, so if this is going to be super low budget or done like all in one, uh, if it's going to be done in one night or two nights, then it kind of has to be mostly one location. And what those guys discovered at the end of their analysis is like, if a movie is supposed to take place just in one location, then as far as story goes, that location better be really freaking important to the story. So that also churned out okay now this movie is actually about this couple and the renovations aren't just they're not just there for like um set decoration but it's a part of their story and it's an ongoing conversation that happens in scenes so yeah but we can continue sorry i just want to <laughs> no there. no absolutely <laughs> now the, the biggest challenge i would imagine uh is working with actors in such a short period of time like I understand that they memorize lines, but Mm -hmm. I'm assuming it's not verbatim. I'm assuming you let some things fly. There was some dialogue ad libs or things just kind of like generalized a little bit, or did everyone literally go word for word on this? Okay. So I know that Mumblecore exists and I know that Scriptments exists, but I did not want to spend two years on a project in which could be like, you know, it could be the last thing I do for 20 years. I don't know um, because life takes you in all different directions. I didn't want to do – I didn't want to bring everyone together, get all this stuff prepped and start editing it. And all of a sudden I'm, I'm realizing that dialogue is flat or we're missing key things. So my request was that everyone be off book. And I swear to God, Mason Hydra's a champ. Like I could not believe it. He knew every person's line because he 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 recorded himself reading the whole script and just listened to it day after day. All the other actors had such a easier workload compared to him. But there was a couple actors who I said, and in particular, um, his lead counterpart, Tori Titmus. She had trained with the Second City Conservatory, all improv. She's a maestro. She's amazing. She walked in and. I started realizing she not only had lines down, but she could improvise things to add to them and improve my dialogue just by allowing her character to go a little more up and down at times. So for the most part, I'd say lines were about 98% as written, which I'm really proud of. And it wasn't like blooper after blooper. It was just people came in and they knew what they had to bring and they brought it. It was really, really awesome. I think from my experience working in the business is when you raise the the bar – for for crew for for actors for everybody involved with the project they either show up and 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 rise to the occasion or they completely crack under the pressure and i mean it's the bottom line and something like making a film in 2 days like you were mm-hmm. doing uh you'll know real quick if you're cracking or not and and i guess it's just so much pressure uh such fat like how many takes did you do i must I, I mean i can't imagine you doing more than a couple takes um, each scene. Yeah, the, the maximum we did any scene would have been like three and a half full takes. Mm-hmm. Um, and there was a few that we nailed just in one and never really looked back. Like we just did it and we're, we're like, that's good, let's go. Um, but there's some things that I think you might find interesting um, pertaining to the cast. So like the movie Birdman looks sure. like it's shot all in one t- take, but right. it's like 13 shots stitched or whatever. Mm-hmm. They rehearsed that for 30 days or three months or something leading up. This movie, and this may sound super irresponsible, and I wouldn't ask anyone else to ever do this, but it was a nature of what we were put under, the circumstances. I had never even met our lead actress, Tori, nor had Mason until 9 p.m. the night before shooting their 61-page Act 2 romance film. Yeah. So... It was freaking crazy. So they were like, hi, nice to meet you. It's game time tomorrow, so let's take the next hour and a half to talk it out. And reason being is the day before shooting day, or sorry, yeah, 
24 hours before shooting day one, we got hit with the biggest blizzard in like the last three or four years in Michigan, 15 inches of snow in 24 hours and no one can drive. And Tori and two other actors are coming from Chicago up to the Detroit area where we are. And they're taking the train and the train's getting stuck. And at, at one point the train just lost power and then Tori missed the train. And it, it all boiled down to like, holy shit, this film may not happen unless people get here. And we had a crew of 10, which deflated to five the day before shooting. And so it, it came down to me on Steadicam, which was you know pre-planned, two shooters on long lenses, a sound uh, recordist or uh, audio supervisor listening to the four different lavalier mics going at once, and a first AD who took on all five other roles that were missing. So this, just due to the blizzard, this became like, it could have been a complete bust if we were missing like one or two more um, pieces of the puzzle. <laughs> That's insane. I mean, I feel you because I, I mean, when I did Ego and Desire at Sundance, I had never met any of my actors. And uh, mm-hmm. it was the day of, and they just showed up at Sundance and... Before then, it was just Skype calls, and and they mm-hmm. never. I think they had to had the pleasure of meeting each other shortly because they were all coming from New York. But uh, you know, it's it kind of adds to the vibe. It, it kind of adds to the to the energy of the situation. I mean, you you got to be planned, but you I mean, you're we're crazy. I mean, I mean, me doing what I did, you doing what you did. We're, we're nuts. We're nuts doing yeah. something like that. So you've got to kind of embrace the nuttiness of it and mm-hmm. and just kind of like, you know, don't hide away from it. Like, don't pretend to be what you're not. Like, this is what we're doing. This is how we're doing it. Get on the train because it's already left the station. <laughs> yeah. And it, it totally works. It's just like some of those directors who shoot on film and they say, the minute you hear the film gate shut and everyone realizes we're going to run out of uh film at a certain point like the day will just you'll just run out everyone has to kind of like the vibe changes and we're all in it together we're either gonna make it or we're not and um as much as i was hoping the day was going to go pretty close like day one was gonna go pretty close to my schedule man the whole it all went completely different like um, oh of course (laughs) yeah yeah in it just crazy ways uh, which I could elaborate on unless you want to discuss uh, other things in the meantime. No, I'm sure. I, look, I, I mean, we could talk for hours on everything that went wrong. I'm sure. <laughs> that you, no, that, no. That, not wrong. Not even so much. That, that, that yeah, wrong. Not so much. But not as planned. Like I didn't plan a lot of things uh, on my movie. And sometimes they were good. Sometimes they weren't. But you roll mm-hmm. with the punches. When you're doing a movie like this, and I want everyone listening to understand this, when you're doing movies that are – two days or four days or something so quick or very ambitious. You've got to roll with the punches on a 30 day shoot. You can kind of really take your time, you know, do things. Oh, this doesn't work. We can come back to it. There's no time for that. So you've got to like, Oh, we, we, we only have five crew members. Now, what are you going to do? We mm-hmm. got to roll. We got to go. What can we do? And you got to kind of adapt uh, and move forward no matter what, because as I, like they said, the train has left and there's no stopping it. So either you jump off the train or you get on and just go with whatever comes. Do you agree? Yeah, that's the only way you can do it. And it has to be sort of top down leadership. So if you are fretting, then other mm-hmm. people start to fret and it all the wheels fall off. So you just have and you almost have to know going in, like you said, we're nutty to even attempt it. So as I was like sending out like proposal videos to actors like i have an offer for you i'd love for you to play like a supporting role of this or that i kind of i i didn't laugh through them but i i totally recognize that this may sound crazy to you and yes we're still gonna do it so are you in and yeah it creates camaraderie for sure there's two things i wanted to you you, i wanted to point out that you just said one the leader it it starts at the top and two a casting when you cast a film like this you really need to be very careful on who you bring in because a lot of times you'll have an actor say, oh, yeah, yeah, I can do it. I'll do it. But they really need to be on board with this process because it's an unlike any normal filmmaking process. And mm-hmm. if they're used to doing it one way and they they say they're going to do it and they come in and you're like, you're off and running, the whole thing could come crashing down. If you're a lead, 
really started, I mean, you, everything had to go perfectly for you to make this work. And if your lead would have forgotten lines, had attitude, ego, any of this kind of stuff, the whole mm-hmm. thing would have come off the tracks. Would you, correct? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> pretty true. <laughs> so we're insane to even attempt this because there's so many moving parts and everything has to land perfectly. There's no mm-hmm. room for, oh, uh, you know, there's a mistake here. There's a mistake there. This guy's not doing his job or he's not pulling their weight here or she's got an attitude. He's, he's crying because he can't deal the pressure. Whatever it is, you don't have the, the bandwidth to handle those kind of things because of the speed you're doing it. And so be very, very careful on who you cast behind the scenes and in front of the lens as well. I mean, I'm assuming you agree with all that. I do, but I would argue that I don't think like uh, when, when you say that the only way it can happen is if everything was right or if we get very no. lucky there and I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, like reacting really to that. But I'll say there was things all along the way that you just hit, you hit them and you keep going. And right. I already, I already knew like, hey, if someone can't get lines or if they, if it wasn't going to work, we already just had a script waiting. And I would even do it one line at a time if I needed to, just to push through. So it's just sort of like for me, it didn't seem like there was a lot of pressure. Um, until we hit the point where it was 6 p.m., we had nine scenes done, and we had 25 more scenes to do before midnight. That's Ooh. when that's when shit turned up, and it, it went to 11, and there was no time to breathe, and it was just go, go, go. Uh, that's where it was sort of like the money. This is where you put your money where your mouth is, and you really realize what it takes to shoot half a movie in a night. It's It was... It was Freaking crazy. You know, yeah, I know. It, without without question. And when I say everything has to kind of work, is like if you would have had your lead actor or one or two actors just break down and right. not yeah, move yeah. forward, the machine the machine stops working. Because yeah. those cogs need to be there or or you're gonna have to adjust story or you're gonna have to move things around. And that's the risk of going in through this. But I'm assuming because of your experience and and shooting as much as you have, you felt very comfortable that you could do this and this is not something you should do right out of film school generally speaking you should have some sort of have some wealth of experience and also people who you hire have some sort of wealth of experience that they can fall back on because Mm -hmm. when things don't go the way you want them to go and they won't (laughs) because everything wasn't exactly the way you planned i'm sure but Mm -hmm. it's but you have something to fall back on as opposed to like well i only know how to do it this one way and if it doesn't do this way I can't move forward. You have to have two, three backup plans, but you got to keep moving, but it's very, you have to be very careful. And then secondly, the, the leader, the leading from the head from the front aspect of this, Mm -hmm. when you're doing something like this, it is so outside the norm of the filmmaking process that if your leader, which is the director falters, has stress, has a breakdown, everything will just stop. Yeah. Fair enough to say. Yeah. And man, for me, when I'm doing two jobs and renovating a house and this is my one chance to kind of break free from all that and just shoot, there wasn't even a question about cracking or anything. It was more so, hey, I've shot 25 weddings where it's one and done. You, They only kiss at the altar once or they only enter the reception hall once. So you got to be on it. So at this point, it's like, even if we screw something up, hey, we could do a second take right now. It's fine. Or I'm just happy to be in this room with all these people at once and be working with so many talented people that even if something breaks or doesn't work, I'm still doing it with a smile because this is the funnest part. Like this is like Jim Jarmusch says, this is the act of sex in the filmmaking process. So it's just fun. Yeah, absolutely. And that's the mentality you have to go into that with. If you're not having fun, like when you know when I was doing my film, I'm running around. I had a ball, and I think there, it, I, don't, I don't get to talk to filmmakers who who do the things I've done very often. Mm-hmm. Isn't it kind of exhilarating being out on a tightrope with no yeah. net, with no net? Like there's on a creative standpoint, as an artist, you're on uncharted territory, and mm-hmm. you've got a group of people around you, 
And I find it exhilarating. I find it, you know, other people would crack. They would just lose their mind because it's not, they can't control everything. I love being out there. What's your feeling on it? I feel like it's like took me back to high school basketball. It's fourth quarter. Your team's down 10. You've, your shot is on. And like, let's go. Let's duke it out to the end. And every every decision you're going to make is just going to be fun or, or just you're going to make your best choices you can with your best people behind you. Like you got an awesome shooter on your left, an awesome shooter on your right. You got to trust them. You can't go over their shoulder and say, what are you setting up? Let me see that. It's like, no, just I trust you. Your own, you're your own mini director and cinematographer. So are you. And so am I. And I, I might cross your paths or something when I'm steady camming. But for the most part, if you miss a shot, just pick it up. Know that you got two other stellar shooters who are doing their best to do that. And like time, time told that at the end of the process, the footage we got and the performances we got amidst sort of the chaos was awesome. And it, no part about that, like act two felt, oh, they just rushed this off or like this, you can tell, you can feel the actors are rushing through or the cameras aren't ready. Like it pretty much just worked. But like you said, it takes years of experience to go in if the Canon C200 didn't have the ability to do like face tracking um, and autofocus things on lenses that we have, then I would have shot it completely differently. I probably would have just go like sitcom style and just stay wide. But I was trying to infuse, you know, dolly push ins or to an extent with a steady cam and reveals and things like that. So sorry, I went off on a little tangent. No, no, that's fine. That's fine. Um, now, how did you convince everybody to come back in seven months? <laughs> <laughs> like trying to gather the crew um, up the first time is tough enough, let alone trying to bring it back seven months later. Well, it's it's not so hard to convince them to come back. It's just are their schedules open? Right. And the last thing I wanted this to be was like the minute we got a day that could work, I was like, we got to lock it in now. Because if we if we say, no, let's go for like a, a month later and try that. And then something happens and then one person can't make it. Yeah. Now you're talking, do I rewrite scripts? Do I? Do I start sacrificing everything? Um, so it's mostly mostly just getting them there. Um, and in terms of like shooting the crew, they're just pumped because this is Michigan, and we don't get films, especially with people you know, like your old college uh, classmates, and you know they're good, and they know that you're putting together a good team. So they just want they want in. So you know, it's just a really a uh, great opportunity for Evan and Bob, basically. No, the, never underestimate the power of people wanting to belong to a mission, a group, uh, an event of some sort and, and filmmaking, def- especially when it's outside, like in LA, everybody's mm-hmm. making films, everyone's shooting films, everyone's working for free on little projects here and there. But outside of LA, man, yeah. people get really jazzed up when someone comes up and goes, hey, follow me into the into the promised land. I'm going it's going to be crazy, but follow me. And people are like, well, there's nobody else around. Let's do this guy. This guy seems like he knows where he's going. Let's go follow him. So yeah. I did I did that when I was in, in Miami and with a lot of my projects there. And it's just those people were very excited. And I used to make my film into an event. So I, mm-hmm. it, made, it made it bigger than it was. And you obviously did the same thing, <laughs> making yeah, it an and event. That's how you, that's how you get um, people willing to donate food and coffee mm-hmm. and things like that because it's so exciting it's not the norm and um and it's one day yeah, it's just it's one yeah, it's, 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 it's today's <laughs> the, com- the commitment is like can you three dozen box of donuts and coffee as opposed to can we like nag you for a month of free stuff it's just it's a lot to ask so the one day commitment or two day commitment over the course of like a year uh in some ways it makes things a lot more achievable because if we were set out like let's really let's do this epic this uh, time travel epic and if i would try to shoot it traditionally and don't get me wrong our shots our lighting is it would make cinematographers cry because i can recognize there were things that had to be sacrificed but to be able to just do it in two days and say let's prioritize stories number one acting's number two sound and scores number three after that like we can't skimp on those but after that Man, we're gonna get the best shots we can. We're gonna do the best props and like um, set design and wardrobe as we can. But man, those three things. And when you get people, people like Mason Hydra, Tori Titmus, it's just you. You almost feel like in the same way you can trust your other shooters. 
you can just trust the actors. And even if they miss a line, it's okay. They're in character. They might cough in the middle of the line, but they cough in character and things like that. So, and now how yeah, did you just, like, how did great. you light the scene? How did you like the, the, the movie? Cause I'm assuming you, 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 know, you don't have two hours to, to light a scene. So how did you do the lighting? So it's like 50, 50 in, Half the scenes, like a lot of the basement scenes or in our main like kitchen, we had our main kitchen had overhead uh, can lights, eight of them. So basically an array. And in our basement, we set up four practicals that were also an array. So pretty much it was like grid lighting. So as long as characters were within a certain zone of the room, there was always a backlight hitting them. There was always at least three angles hitting them. And it's don't get me wrong. It's not even like like cinematographers are going to say you're an idiot. But when you don't have time, you just got to roll with it. And the other half, we would be like in a bedroom. I know that sh- photographers, they turn their flash and point it at the ceiling, shoot, and you bounce the ceiling and get a great floodlight. That's like 90% of solving the issue with bedroom scenes. Just shoot that soft light at the sky or at the ceiling, let it flood down, and then some practicals as kickers behind them. Right. And, and you know, a lot of people always, you know, will say, you know, kind of poo-poo on your lighting or poo-poo on, on things. Like, oh, it's not as perfect as this. It's not perfect as that. I'm like, well, while you're still talking about it, I finished the movie. Right. And yeah. the audience is listening to the next line of dialogue. They're not looking at the way a light is pointed. You know, they just – As long as it's clean. Matters. As long as it's somewhat right. yeah. clean – People will accept that much more than they would 25, 30 years ago. Like in the, in the world of YouTube and the world of, you know, films, you know, films being shot on an iPhone and things like that, people will forgive okay lighting. They'll even forgive exactly. bad lighting. Like I'm watching a show right now, which I will remain nameless, which is a really good show, but mm-hmm. I can't stand Dan, the cinematographer, like it, he drives me nuts. I, my wife is like, oh, what, what, what is that? Who color graded this? What's going on? But unfortunately, the show is really good. Uh, so mm-hmm. I hope in, in, uh, in the next seasons it'll get better, but you will forgive, uh, you will forgive bad, bad lighting if the story is compelling. I mean, I yeah. mean, look at paranormal activity. I mean, I mean, Jesus, you know, or even our Blair Witch Project. I know those are two very – people always use those. But even Primer, Primer wasn't lit amazingly well, uh, Mm -hmm. but people were enthralled with the story, you know. So I want everybody listening out there to understand that, that if you sit around waiting for everything to be perfect, you're just going to be waiting around 10, 15 years, (laughs) you know. Or you could just make your movie the best you can and get it out there and move on to the next project, which I think you've done that to the next level. <laughs> exactly. It just – if I hadn't shot it in these two days and just kind of like broke the rules and all that stuff, like no one wants to break – no one wants bad lighting. And no one wants like mistakes on audio here or there and things like that or something might be slightly out of focus. You don't – no one wants that. But where I was in my life – there was no more make. There's no more directing films unless I gave it a shot at something very, very short, and um, you know maybe the marketability of shot in two days is something that would intrigue someone. Mm-hmm. But even still, it was more so to it was more so to just do something to just give it a hurrah and see see what we can make for film's sake. Right. Exactly. Now, what is the end game of the film? Like, what do you want to achieve with this film for yourself? Well, hope- We'll hopefully get rich and famous and everything else. I sure, don't know. it's the lottery ticket. Well, yes, yes, we're all just <laughs> yeah, submit yeah, yeah. it to Sundance. <clears throat> just wait for the check, wait for the the um, the uh, the bidding war to happen, and mm-hmm. uh, and you should get two three million dollars for it, and uh, then you'll do the next Marvel movie. So I think it'll all work yeah. out. Yeah, <laughs> perfect. Um, now, when you wake up, what is the true thing that you want this <laughs> to do? Um, my hope is that. It has a Hallmark vibe to it, for sure. Now, I'm not, I can't just sit here and say, like, oh, I'd love to see it on Hallmark. Or I, I think this could work on the Sci Fi channel. Like, that's just, my hope is that with our festival submissions, someone somewhere accepts it, first of all. Maybe no one will. But if they do, then I hope someone sitting somewhere 
hears about it or sees it, or even out of your podcast, someone comes across it and says, oh, this is something we might be interested in or anything like that. Because right now I'm at a stage of just getting, I ne- people don't even know it exists. So you first have, people have to just find out that it exists. And me posting to like our page, our page, our, our page on Facebook, like, oh, we're getting great audience reviews means a whole lot less than, um, some festival picking it up and someone writing a story about it. Because my opinion, like either the film's priceless or worthless, it's, it's depends on who says so. And, um, I don't, to answer your question, I, I I don't know. I'm, uh, hoping I'm going to take all the proper steps that you've outlined to the best of my ability and other, um, resources. I'm going to try to get distribution. I don't think self distribution is really my answer here. Maybe because it was shot so uniquely, there could be a niche market of filmmakers who are interested in how films are made. We did Mm -hmm. shoot, we shot and edited an eight episode behind the scenes as to how it was done on day one, day two, and all the follow-ups. So we've got great content. Um, It's just a matter of like getting the word out and seeing who or where might be interested. Okay. And you and because you have such a low budget, you can kind of have a loosey goosey approach to it. Because it's mm-hmm. not a if, if this movie cost you two hundred grand, uh right. first of all, be, I don't I don't think you be dead. you'd be freaking the hell out. Uh yeah. first of all. And so and also you probably in all good conscience would not have done a movie in two days for two hundred thousand dollars. You know, mm-hmm. it, it it doesn't make sense. And I think that's another thing that filmmakers just have such a you know, they'll just go in all in on a film. And they just like, yeah, let's just do it. And we're going to like, you did it smart, man. You have a very low, you, you know, it's exactly what I preach a film entrepreneur, which is keep your overhead low. So, mm-hmm. you know, if you can't make four grand back, you're in the wrong business. Right. I, I mean, I mean, and, and from what I've seen, I mean, if you're on the show, there's a quality level there that I see that I was mm-hmm. like, oh, there's, uh, this actually has a really good chance of making money. And generating revenue, and I'm really curious to see where it all goes. Uh, so basically, your distribution plan is going to be film festivals first, and see what happens. Basically, I'll see what happens. Then I'll probably reach out. If nothing, I'll after that. Then I would reach directly out to distributors such as any film rights, um, other people you have recommended, mm-hmm. um, and see if they'd have any interest. And if not, maybe reach out to a new branch of distributors. And if not. It's hard to say, like, I don't really know what I would do after that point. Like, I feel like I, other than self, other than just blast my Facebook and do Google targeted ads and try to sell it. It's, that's a, it's a whole lot of money spent hoping you sell some back. It's hard. It's, it's no. And that's, I'm so glad you said that because it's so many filmmakers think that, oh, I'm going to self distribute and I'm going to, oh, I'm just going to do some targeted Facebook ads and this and that. And like. It, it's it, you have a broad spectrum movie, like you. Right, you, I know you, you, you don't have a ni- yeah. You don't have a niche. I mean, the niche is time travel movie. The time travel feel good movie. It's huge. It's a massive, massive niche. You know, mm-hmm. so it's so, you can't really target it. If you would have made, I'm sure you've heard this. If like, if you would have made it the vegan chef time travel movie, yeah, you might have been able you know to know exactly that audience. You yeah. can target that audience, or you know, or he's a surfer, or he's a skateboarder, or whatever. Um, it make it really part. I'm just using that as an analogy, but uh, mm-hmm. but make it really part. Then it's something that you maybe, and that's a big maybe able to do the Facebook targeting and reaching out to that niche. But that's work that you would have had to have done a year ago. Uh, not now, right. you know, so, right. but I do, but I do feel that your film does have really good possibilities, really good legs. And from my experience should sell and should sell very well. And, uh, I'll give you some advice off air, uh, on what I okay. think you could do with it. But I do think you, you have, you have something that could, could do very well for you, especially at that price point. Uh, well, without question. To, if you don't mind me interjecting, then yeah. the nice thing is we sent the film, to about 15 test audience members when it had its like 99.9% cut done with all score, with all color, everything basically done. And so much of the feedback we received was like overwhelmingly positive. Wow. So invested in the story or the characters. And then they'd say, Oh, and I can't, I, I still don't get how was this done in two days? Like I can't, I don't, I can't wrap my head around that. 
but the audience is like sort of general audience members. They love the idea that I was shot in two days, but they just love the story. So that's great. So I feel like we've got the story and we've got real acting talent and really solid sound and music. So it's just a matter of like waiting for the right person to discover it. So we're just trying to get it out. Um, and, oh, and to add, I feel like the because the internet has really radically changed how distribution goes and all these companies can sort of not be outed, but sort of experience and all the knowledge that you're filtering through in every podcast, people are wisening up. And I don't think right now there is a um, perfect answer because like eight years ago or maybe five years ago, people were saying self-distribute, self-distribute. And now they're like, well, don't pay the um, cost, Aggreg- the, yeah. f- the aggregator cost to put it on iTunes because no one's buying it because there's too much content. And who's paying – Three dollars to watch something when Netflix is free all like forever not free but forever or Prime or Prime yeah Prime like new stuff so it's just uh, it's very interesting I don't know yeah and 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 again I'll I'll point this out is that you're in a perfect scenario in a perfect place where you have a movie a piece of product that you've created for four thousand mm-hmm. mm-hmm. dollars if you would have made this for fifty thousand it'd still be a bit, it just it just makes it so much more harder. So if you're able to generate 30, 40, 50 grand off of this movie, I'm assuming that would be a success to you. Hopefully more. Well, if if distributors are listening, that's No, bad. no, no, no. No, no, I know, no, no, no. I know I just that. I understand. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, um trust me, I, I I don't even know if a distributor will, you know, that's a whole other conversation as far as distributors and MGs and yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. No, it's all relative. But to your point, that's 10 times the cost that the film, you know, took to make. So yes. Yeah. And it, it would be a success. Yeah, of course I would love it. A quarter of a million, half a million. But it's all relative, right? It's all relative on, on the thing. And if you're able to do more of these smaller budget films, you start creating that portfolio of films where now you're starting to generate multiple revenue sources coming in from these mm-hmm. films. Uh, and, and then my God, you might even have a, a career in filmmaking and make a living doing what you love to do. What? Just two the, days the, a year. In, in, just two days a year. That's, that's your niche. Your niche is two day movies. That's all you do. Yeah. Time travel, two day movies. That's all you do. This is the beginning of a trilogy, sir. You should do yeah. now another two, <laughs> get another house, do another remodel. <laughs> Yeah, maybe the property brothers were just one step away from realizing what could be done. No, I don't know. Uh, exactly. <laughs> now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests, my friend. Uh, what okay. advice would you give a filmmaker trying to make it in the business today? I would say, where I live in Detroit, there's no such thing as making it in the business for, like, for anyone outside of LA. Because I can't give advice on what they should do when they go there. So I would just say at this point, read the books, read, read the books, do the pre-production, write the scripts, revise, storyboard, do all those things you can before you spend a dime and do them tailored to all of the most useful and unique and maybe, maybe even things people don't see enough on screen, uh, whether it's a house reno or something like, I don't even think. The inside of a house is all that unique, but to see it transform and then transform back in the end, uh, very different. But like, look for things that should be on screen that make your film stand out. Maybe you got a really badass car. Maybe there's just a junkyard behind your neighbor's house, and this junkyard could be settings for some Red Dawn remake or something or a script like that. But like, do everything for nothing, then figure out who's in your market that is an actor or go to local colleges, figure that out. And then you just start making stuff. So you shoot that movie with them. After that, you've got some tiny, tiny street cred. Use that to do something that's a little more polished this time with better people. And then after that, maybe approach actors who could, their, like, their name alone could help in the selling. Although that jump, that going from $4,000 indie to like, hundred thousand dollar and we're paying this actor 10 grand to be here for the day that's a massive jump so i don't i don't even have advice for that i think that's very intimidating yeah got it and i mean you you said a lot of great things in that answer a lot of great things that you should everyone should listen to and take notes on now what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn whether in the film business or in life hmm The 
longest for me to learn was probably stop trying to juggle 200 things at once. Um, <laughs> I, feel, because, I feel you, brother. I feel you. Yeah. It's, it's the name of your freaking podcast, man. It's a hustle. So you never, if you get in that mindset young, and I was raised on a farm where you just busted your ass, period, because there wasn't, there was no other option. You just were told that's what you got to do. So for me, it's like learning to turn it off and not, and it kind of goes with the themes of the film I made. Don't let your ambitions or your time machine take over your life and like make your relationships with people around you crumble. Like it's okay to just turn it off at 5 p.m. and then just go live normal life Um, because we can't, I feel like preaching the dream of this business or industry is um, it, it can have negative consequences and people can go for broke and <laughs> you can go for broke for $4,000 or you can go for broke mortgaging your house and doing a half a million dollar film. Which one's going to, if they both fail, what's the better outcome out of those two, you know? So I don't know, maybe that's the right, that's what I've learned. <laughs> fair enough. Next question. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. What is the biggest fear you had to overcome to make this film? Um, biggest fear? Probably. Probably. Ah, oh shit. Giving in to the the nature of what it was. So. And it happened kind of early. So it was sort of like. Hey, if we're going to make this, like, how the hell am I going to light this? How? And then just realizing, no, you've told people before, it's not about lighting, it's about story. So let it go. And, you know, try to light, but let it go. And throw the boom mic away. Let's just lob everyone. You can buy a $33 mic J, or sorry, $20 mic J off Amazon. It sounds just as good as the Sennheisers. And don't get me wrong, the Sennheisers aren't cream. They're not even necessarily like the COS 11Ds or anything. But dude, for like very cheap, you can mic every single person in that. You have 12 people mic'd and then just switch the uh, wireless pack to each person in the room per scene and yada, yada. But it's just sort of like letting things go and knowing that the 80% rule, like if, like I told mm-hmm. my shooters, if you get 80% of this pretty darn good, we're moving on. We can't reset something to help you get a shot because we started that way in the beginning and we just had to right away break, break old habits and realize like this ha- this is just going to keep moving and you're going to let things go and you might miss a shot but suck it up like you'll get your next shot in the next scene or 20 scenes from now or 30 scenes from now when we're still shooting tonight mm-hmm. um that that's probably it all right and the three of your favorite films of all time um i would say Jurassic Park Up and Fargo Wow, you had them you had them listed ready to go. Nice. Yeah, I've watched your podcast enough to know that's <laughs> That's a good combination, good combination yeah. of films. And where can where can people find you? They can find me. Honestly, you can just email me straight up, grantpickle at gmail.com or make Careful. Time the movie at gmail. Careful. Oh, sorry. <laughs> well, I get too much solicitation. Well, um basically Facebook. We do have a Twitter for the film. Um, if you just search it, or if you, even if you just go to makingtimethemovie.com, you'll see more things about it. Um, and I did have, I did set up a link for any podcast listeners. I don't know if you want me to mention that or no. As far as, for, yeah, I mean, uh, I could put it in the show notes. Okay. Um, yeah. But otherwise, yeah, so pretty much hit me up on Facebook or Twitter. I don't even have an Instagram, and our Twitter is just the movie Twitter. And I don't have time for that stuff. So. <laughs> You're too busy making two-day movies, man. Yeah. <laughs> Grant, man, thank you so much for being on the show, brother. I, I do appreciate it. You are uh, an inspiration to hopefully a lot of people listening. And hopefully somebody listening right now is going to go, you know what? If this guy can make a two-day movie up in Detroit, Michigan, I can go do something in five days. You yeah, know, for, <laughs> Yeah, so hopefully, man. So thanks again for being on the show, brother. Thank you so much, Alex. I really appreciate it. I want to thank Grant for coming on the show and inspiring the tribe to go out and make their own film. If he can make something in two days, what could you do with five days? What could you do if you were shooting on a property that was pretty controlled 
meaning that you're not going to be running around. You can get a lot of different locations in that property, whether it be in the house, uh, in the back, all sorts of different things. And he, this wasn't a large property. This was just his house. He was able to do this. So think outside the box, guys, because moving forward, we're going to have to think things a little differently when making our films. And I hope this episode has inspired you to know that it can be done. If you want links to anything we spoke about in this episode, including to watch the amazing documentary on how Grant made this, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 401. And thank you all so much for the great response to the new podcast, Filmmaking Motivation, that I am releasing every Tuesday now on both Indie Film Hustle and its own podcast, Filmmaking Motivation. If you want the latest episodes that are coming out, Filmmaking Motivation is the only place to get it. If you want to check that out, head over to the ifhpodcastnetwork.com and you can get not only that podcast, but a bunch of new podcasts that we're adding from other creators as well. Thank you again for listening, guys. As always, keep that hustle going. Keep that dream alive. Stay safe out there, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com. 